see if technology is going to work in my favor today. Amen. Let me see if I can do it. To come up. Oh, yeah, look at that. Amen. Mission misinformation. Amen. The elderly couple was beginning to forget little things around the house, and they were afraid that this would become dangerous as one of them might forget to turn off the stove or and cause a fire or something crazy like that. So they decided to go to their doctor to get some help. So the doctor told them that many people at their age find it useful to write themselves little notes as reminders. Um, if, so they won't forget. The couple thought that this was a great idea, so they left the doctor's office and were excited to implement the new advice. When they got home, the wife said, Dear, will you please go into the kitchen and get me a dish of ice cream? And why don't you write it down like the doctor said so you won't forget? Nonsense, said the husband. I can remember a dish of ice cream. That's easy. Well, the wife said, I would also like some strawberries on it. Just write it down. Let's use what the doctor told us to do, and you won't forget. Don't be silly, replied the husband. Some ice cream and some strawberries. Easy. I can remember that. Okay, dear, but I would also like you to put some whipped cream on top. Now, please, you better write that down, said the wife. Come on now. My memory's not that bad, said the husband. No problem. A dish of ice cream, strawberries, and whipped cream. No problem. With that, the husband walked into the kitchen and closed the door behind him. Fifteen minutes later, he comes out from the kitchen with a plate of bacon and eggs. He takes it to the wife who looks at the plate, looks up at her husband and said, I knew you wouldn't get it right. Where is the white toast? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, you know, this is a little illustration about failing to listen properly. And it's a lighthearted illustration but what I'm talking about tonight is far from light-hearted we need to gain a, a tactical advantage against the enemy and and one area that I feel you know I told you guys before a lot of times when I pray I ask God to show me uh, some of the enemy's tactics against God's people because that, that's what I want to know about I want to know about that so I can help God's people overcome and I can overcome and I can know how to fight this battle and I came across this scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And, and, and what we're finding out through this text is that Christianity, we have, we've been very diligent in, in teaching about demonic activity and, and casting out demons and, and the anointing and the supernatural. We believe all those things. And we're a full uh, gospel, full gift believing church. But Paul writes a very interesting statement here to Timothy about something that's going to happen in the last days. And I found it very interesting that God decided to put this in his word to give us a hint of what's going to be the main strategy that the enemy is going to use against God's children. So let's read it together. First Timothy chapter four, verse one. And the word of God says, but the spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. But the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter days some will fall away from the faith, paying attention, other translations say giving heed or listening to, deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. See, our biggest threat tonight in these last days is not the things that go bump in the night or demonic possession or demonic oppression. One of our biggest threats is the mission of the enemy to bring misinformation to God's people and to have God's people listening to the wrong things in these last days. Let's pray here. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you have your way in this place. God, I pray that you increase as I decrease, God, that you get all the glory, all the honor, all the praise in this place, that you bring us understanding here tonight, God, through your word, Lord, and that you help us, God, to see this, this tactic of the enemy very clearly, Lord, so that we can defend against it, guard against it in our lives. And in Jesus' name we pray, and the church says amen, amen. and amen. So I kind of want to do an expository sermon, which just basically just means we're going to take this scripture and we're going to break it down here uh, bit by bit. And I wanted to start off with this phrase explicitly says, you know, uh, New King James says, speaketh 
expressly or the King James Version. And what it's talking about is the rhetoric, is the way that the Spirit is bringing this about. And, and it's using the picture in the Greek of something that is spoken so clearly that it's unquestionable, that it's certain, and that it is sure. You know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that we can just glance over. There's a lot of parts of the Bible. As much as I thought that I knew the Bible, the, the Bible trivia always humbles me. And I go, what? Who are they talking about? I've never read that name before. I never heard of that. And I've listened to thousands of countless sermons in my lifetime. And I still am um, surprised and taken aback by different things that I read. And I'm like, man, or different things that I hear or see. Because sometimes the, the, the mind has a way of taking things that are less important to us and kind of sweeping them away um, to another place. You know, I don't know how many here are afraid of uh, bugs, you know, but, uh, but uh, too ma not too many of us, I would say, can see a spider and it runs off into the, uh, behind a wall or something and we're up all night waiting for the spider to come back out, right? No, we kind of have a way of just going on about our lives, right? We've seen it there. It passed by. It could have posed a threat. Maybe it doesn't pose a threat at all to you. Uh, but, but it's hard to just, uh, it gets easy to just ignore certain things. So this is why in this statement that Paul is trying to get Timothy to understand that this is something that the Spirit of God wanted clearly stated, and it's for our benefit. It's a warning to us that are a part of this last days nonsense. We are living in the last days, and you got to understand that that doesn't mean that, well, Jesus can come back at any moment, but I'm not saying he's going to come back next week. What I'm telling you is that we, we are in the mode. The stage is set, and things can are moving very rapidly. So when the Bible says that in these latter days, the Spirit, uh, the Spirit of God is, is explicitly stating that this was going to be a problem in the church today. And as I'm reading this, I'm like, wow, like the word of God just comes alive because I know many, many believers uh, and a lot of believers that I don't know personally, but I can just see the things they write on the Internet on different Christian songs or posts. There is a mission to just bring misinformation and misunderstanding of God's word to God's children. And there's people following crazy doctrines I was watching. And, and, and I get so mad because I'm like, man, it's these type of churches that hurt people. And then they don't want to come to a good church. I, I seen a video of a church that like only in church. And, and the pastor's got all the women laying down on the floor. And then he's got his belt out and he's spanking them all on by the altar. Crazy stuff, right? But it's happening in the house of God. So we got people who come in and they've been to churches like that. They've had crazy experiences. And it's a tactic from the enemy. See, many of us are looking for the wolf and we don't realize that the Bible says that the wolf comes in sheep's clothing. And, and this verse wants to illuminate this thought process. It's trying to get the oil running in, our, in our, the engine that is our mind and say, wait, wait, hold on a second. Uh, my biggest threat in the last days is misinformation, is listening to the wrong things and, and following the wrong things. And the Holy Spirit really wanted us to grasp this. Second Peter 3.16, I have it here. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter writes about Paul, says, also in all his letters, he's speaking to Paul here, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which, notice the correlation here, the untaught and the unstable. So he's saying there are people who are reading hard to understand scriptures. And because they are untaught and because they are unstable spiritually, he's not talking about mentally psychopaths. He's saying un and spiritually they're unstable. What do they do? They distort. He said, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. And what does it bring about in their lives? Their own destruction. And, and this is the fight that is in church. You got, you got uh, uh, pastors that strive to bring God's word and bring it in clarity and bring it in power. And then, and then you got people who still just want to do their own thing and listen to crazy people. But it's a sign of the day and the age that we live in. But the question is not what everybody else is going to do. The question is what are we going to do as believers? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself, approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately 
handling the word of truth. So we have a responsibility to ourselves. There's going to be a lot of goofies out there. There's going to be a lot of pastors spanking their congregation. There's going to be a lot of weird people saying weird things about the Bible, doing weird things with the scriptures. Paul warned us. Peter warned us, telling us they, they do this to their own destruction. But what are we going to do? We are responsible for ourselves and the information that we're allowing to come into our lives and the information that we are allowing ourselves to live by. We are in control of that. And we have a call to be diligent. This is not something that you just, you just take for granted. Oh, well, I have the Bible and I've read it a few times. I go to a Bible-believing church, so I'm good. That's not something to take for granted. We must be diligent that we are presenting ourselves approved to God, that we don't need to be ashamed that we say, no, I know that I'm accurately handling the word of truth. The people that are distorting it, the ones who are spiritually unstable, you know them, I know them, there's some of them that are in my life. I know they're spiritually unstable. I don't get caught down the rabbit holes with them. I tell them, you know, if I hear something weird, uh, okay, no problem, and I push on with my life. But I don't allow myself to get drawn into those crazy debates, distortion of scriptures, things that I just outrightly know are wrong because what the enemy wants to do is plant a seed. The devil knows God's word more than me and you. He knows the scripture where Jesus says, just like the gospel is a seed, the devil wants to plant seeds of lies and seeds of misinformation. And he says, if I can just plant this in their mind, they'll, they'll, they'll push it to the back. They won't even think about it no more. And little by little, that thing can grow in their mind. And it says that this is something that the Holy Spirit wanted us to know about. Not to scare us, but to prepare us. So it says, no, listen, this is something that's around the corner. And in the latter days, we're going to have to be able to prepare ourselves and defend against this line of attack up here. See, it's not the attack on our bodies. It's not the attack on our finances. It's the attack of the mind. And the enemy loves, I mean, just loves to bring deception. And he starts off with misinformation. He starts off with, think about it in the garden. I always tell people, you want to know how the enemy operates? Look how he had to operate when there was no sin to use. Because now we have sin. We have temptation of the flesh. We get angry thoughts. We get lustful thoughts. We get perverted thoughts. Whatever the case may be, perverted just simply doesn't mean sex. It just simply means Anything that is, not, that is not pure that God wanted. We think about things. We could think pervertedly about money. We could think just weird thoughts. We have to contend with those things now in our flesh. But in the Garden of Eden where there was no sin and all the enemy had to work with, he needed to bring sin into the world. He could not tempt even Adam with lustful thoughts. There was no lust. He could not tempt them with angry thoughts and evil thoughts. There was no anger. There was no evil. Notice how he approaches Eve. And he didn't do that because she's weak. He did that because if you read and you study the story through, Eve did not hear from God. Adam got the direction from God. And then God made Eve after, entrusting Adam with the word of God to give it to the one who did not directly hear it. We know that Adam failed along the way or didn't rightly discern that word because when the devil comes to Eve and tells her, did God really say that? Her response is not what God said. But this is his tactic. And it's as old as time itself. And he wants us to question different things. He wants us to think differently about what God's word says. There's an attack on God's word and about the information from God's word. And you have to decide as a believer, what am I going to do? Am I going to prepare myself? Am I going to get in God's word? Am I going to know what I'm listening to? Am I going to control the different people that I'm allowing to have influence in my life? Because there's some spiritual cuckoos people out there. Believe me. I've met a bunch of them. I met some of them that are in sexually immoral lives. 
I mean, literally living just in direct perverted sin. And then they'll tell you that they have the anointing of God and they're healing people and they're walking and, and people are getting slain. And I'm like, man, that's not what the Bible says is going to be happening. You'll meet some, some spiritual cuckoo's nest. They always think about that, that movie with, with Jack Nicholson. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. You know, he looks all crazy with that beanie cap. Because some of them are out there. But I'll be doing myself a disservice if I just allow them to just be speaking into my life and I'm listening to these things. Why, why sit there and listen to it? Why sit there and even give thought to it or give voice to it? It's off. I know it's off. I don't need to correct them. I just push on. Because I understand through this scripture what the enemy wants to do. He doesn't, he doesn't need you to right away go believe it and go live it. He doesn't need you to tomorrow become a Jehovah's Witness. What he needs is for a Jehovah's Witness to plant a seed in your mind, get you thinking, and the next thing you know you're like, man, it sounds really good what they're saying. Don't you think that's why the, a lot of these cults, when they come to your house, or they come and talk to you, they go, let me show you in your Bible. That is a strategy from the enemy. He's trying to get your mind working. He's trying to get your mind going. And then you get to a place where you're like, man, pastor, I don't know, but some of these things don't, don't really sound off. They kind of make sense. That's the strategy. And that's the strategy that a lot of Christians are not, are not paying attention to in the latter days. And the Spirit of God gave us a great warning. It says, it says it explicitly. That means like with a demand, with a command that this was so important, it could not be left out of God's word. That in the latter days, in the later days, some will fall away from the faith. This is what the devil is going to use to pull people from the faith in these days. Not sin, not disbelief in God, listening to weird deceitful spirits and weird doctrines. This Greek word for fall away is a histomy. It's a compound word taken for apo and histamine. Apo means to be away from. Histamine means to stand. So it gives the, the you know, the, a Greek word, a language has 11 million words. English only has four. So when you're breaking down the Greek, you got to understand when you're breaking it down, what they're using in the phrasing. This phrasing for apistomy means to stand apart from but not right away. It doesn't mean to jump from. It means that they are withdrawing from. They are shrinking away from. They are pulling away from, and it is a gradual, gradual process. So God says, you're not just rejecting my word. No, 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 no. You're not just leaving the church and leaving the faith and just out of nowhere from one day to the next, you're gone. What the enemy does is little by little. This is the picture of that Greek word. Here's God's word, right? And I have it in my life. It means a lot to me. Can't let this go. I, I know what it says. I know God's word backwards and forward. I know the truth from God's word. Apahistomy, falling away from the faith, in God's word, what the devil wants to you to do is, here's the first step. Okay, I got it right here. And then I can hear somebody on the other side with that other little piece of wood. Oh, you know, man, that's not really what God's word says. And this word gives you the picture that little by little, you're like this. Could be weeks. Could be months. Could be years. But you're gradually walking away from what at one point was so important to you. And then sooner, it just takes you out. And this is what, the, this is what Paul's telling Timothy. These are the last days. These are how the Christians are going to be leaving faith in God. And read the testimony of Christians that are leaving church. You know what the, next, the latest lie is? I am the church. That is taking a lot of Christians from the faith. A little bit of scripture a whole lot of nonsense. But little by little, they believe it. Now you got Christians who are encouraging other Christians not to have a home church, not to have a pastor, not to go to Bible studies. Just decide for yourself 
what the word of God means. You don't need to a church. You are the church. Little by little, they're walking away. It's a gradual departure. What's sad is this, this phrasing also depicts a person who doesn't even realize that the transition is taking place. They don't even notice that they're that far away. Like the undercurrents at the lake, just pulling you out slowly, slowly, slowly. And you wake up and you're like, man, the shore's all the way over there and I'm all the way out here now in the middle of nowhere. See, we look for the outright rejections of God in our lives. And we say, no, 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 that's wrong, that's sin. I know that that's wrong and that's sin. And we say, that's the devil trying to attack me. Quit on God, that's the enemy. He wants me to quit on God. And we see all the blatant attacks, and then we don't even realize the subtle ones that the enemy has started to place in our, our path. I met good Christians. They tell me, man, I was so close to just leaving the faith altogether because of all the nonsense that was going on in the churches. But that's the latter day tactic from the enemy. To fall away from the faith slowly, gradually, one step at a time, little by little. And it starts with listening. He says they're paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Some, in the latter days, some will fall away from the faith. Why are they falling away? Because they've been paying attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. This word, pay attention, is from the Greek word posheko, meaning to embrace. So it's talking about somebody who is embracing one thing, but here's the beauty of the Greek language. It's not talking about somebody who's just grabbing something, right? They just grab it and walk away, embrace. It literally means this. This thing is here. I have God's word, the truth. I want to embrace the lies of a deceitful spirit or a doctrine, a demonic doctrine, I'm literally making an exchange. I put down one and then I embrace the other. So the scripture here is saying that this is what is taking place. Little by little, the devil says, I need you to wander this way. Listen to this spirit. Listen to this lie. And little by little, what you thought was so solid in your walk with God. No, I know this is true about God's word. We can start to exchange that for something that's not biblical. This is why there's Christians out there who can read a straight up scripture from God's word. They can see the correlation from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And they can say, no, nah, no, nah, I don't have to live that way. All the while, they say, don't what? Deceive yourself. Deceitful, root word deceive, spirits that don't want you to have both thoughts living together. They want you to exchange one for the other. Wandering away, losing one's path. The spirits in today's day and age, their main goal is not to blow out your tire. Their main goal is not to have you stub your toe in the middle of the night or trip when you walk. You ever be walking down the street and just randomly trip and then you get all embarrassed looking around? Who's, did anybody see that? You're like, man, lying devil? No. <laughs> the spirits of this day are not trying to trip you up. They want to bring lies and confusion misinformation so slowly but surely you willingly exchange the truth for a lie and you embrace it notice that word to embrace you embrace and you accept it the same way you ever notice you can be in a i'll say conversation not debate or argument conversation with another believer who's just believing an outright lie that's not true from the bible Notice how strong they are in their defense because they've embraced it. It's true to them. And we can sit there and say, I'll never get like that. The Bible says, pride comes before the fall. 
The enemy says, you think I want you to be, what, gay or trans or something crazy like that? That's not even his main attack right now. Because that's all I hear behind the pulpit. And I understand why people get tired of it. It's not the only sin in the world to be gay, okay? It's not the only sin that people struggle with. One of them, but it's not the only one. But, the, but that's all Christians want to talk about because the majority of Christians don't battle with that. But talk to Christians about cussing. Talk to Christians about drinking. Talk to Christians about being in flirtatious relationships on the phone and DMs. Oh, and you'll get in a whole array of different beliefs. And a lot of them won't. You can give them a scripture dead to your face. This is what the Bible says about how you're living. No, 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 that's not how I see it. They've embraced the truth for a lie. But they'll get on there on Sunday morning. There's a pastor right now on, on YouTube talking about now he's eating uh, uh, edibles and he doesn't think it's smoking weed, eating, eating edibles. Edibles is weed candy, gummies, brownies, getting high. Well, it's not the same as smoking. Oh, he's exchanged a truth for a lie. But I've heard some of his teachings. Oh, we got to stand for what the word of God says and right is right and wrong is wrong. Oh, but when it comes to your little desires, oh, you find a way to explain it away. True for a lie. The Bible says don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. It's not talking about having a friendship. It's talking about having an intimate relationship with somebody. Don't seek that out. And it's not talking about two people who are already married and one person got saved. It's talking about one person is saved, the other person wants nothing to do with God, and you're choosing to enter in that relationship. God says, you shouldn't even be pursuing that stuff. You can tell a Christian that, oh, no, no, he's mine. He'll get right one day. I'll change him, pastor. You'll get the husband. No, 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 she's fine. Look at her. She, she loves me in her own way, and she believes in God. They'll take the scripture, and they'll reject it. But ask them about the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah, thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Oh, they know all the hard ones that they're, they're staying strong with. And they don't even realize that the enemy took, the enemy's got them twisted. They're embracing a whole nother truth. If you don't, if you don't believe that the Bible is inerrant, un, infallible, meaning that there's, you can't change it, then how can you claim to be a Christian? How? Because if you can change fornicators should not inherit the kingdom of heaven, if you can change that scripture and say, oh, I know it says that, but this is how, if that was possible, then you can change that Jesus is the only way. Now you see how people got there. Now you see how people like Oprah and then can stand up there and T.D. Jakes and them People who were so strong in the faith at one point and now say, well, maybe there is another way. That's the process. It starts with a simple lie of misinformation. And gradually, they exchange the truth. Isaiah 5, 20, verse 21. Look at this verse. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute, we know what substitute means, right? Exchange, darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I can't get to the next verse there. Verse 21 says, though, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. The word woe means like complete and utter despair upon yourself. It, that's what it's saying there. Woe to you. You should be in complete and utter despair over your situation. What situation is that? Oh, calling evil good and good evil. Man, that's powerful stuff. This is a direct prophecy to what's going on right now. And I'm not even talking about the world. I'm talking about in church. Right now, in church, in the body of Christ, we call evil good and good evil. 
We're substituting darkness for light and light for darkness. Substituting bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Why? Because he said those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. That tells me you made your own assumptions. You're on your own intellect. You decided your own way. The Bible says, woe to you, man. Woe to us. In preparing this message, I had to ask myself, man, Junior, are you calling evil things good? That's a real question to ask. I'm not holier than thou, mighty than thou, stronger than thou. I'm a real person just like you and me. So real that I almost used a different word right there when I was about to say I'm a real person. I got to decide for myself. In my life, in my walk, am I calling evil good and good evil? Am I substituting darkness for light? Sweet for bitter? Do I think I'm clever in my own eyes? Do I think I'm wise in my own eyes? Questions we should be asking ourselves. But often we don't. You know who we ask that of? Other people. All the time. That's why Jesus said, before you can help anybody else, you got to help yourself. Because Jesus knew by human nature, we just automatically, we know the answers for everybody else's life but our own. We do. Come on now, we do. We know what everybody else should be doing. We know it. I know what they need to do. I know. Give me a week with those kids, and they won't be acting like that no more. Amen? Oh, I know what she needs to do with her husband. Whip, whip that boy into shape. That's what she needs to do. Check that fool already. Okay. What about the areas of your life that are going completely unchecked? That's why Jesus was saying, he's not saying that to put us down. He's telling us, you're going to fall right into the trap the enemy wants you to. Worried about everybody else's specs, and you have a plank. That's not how the plank gets fixed. The plank gets fixed by working on that first, and then you can help somebody else, because now you can see clearly. And Jesus knew this. He goes, no, no, no. He's trying to tell the disciples, listen, don't worry about everybody else's stuff. Before you can help anybody else, you got to help yourself. Just like on an airplane, what do they tell you about the oxygen mask? Before you try to put someone else's mask on, put yours on. Because God forbid you're trying to help somebody else and you pass out from no oxygen, now you both pass out. Right? That's why they tell you that. Before you try to help anybody else, ask Brother John if I'm lying. I'm pretty sure he's been on a lot of flights. Put your mask on first, and then you can properly help somebody else. And this is what God's telling us to do. Jesus said, no, 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 first work on your plank, because then you can see clearly. What are we going to see clearly? Now we can see how hard it is to change things in our lives. So now we're going to come with grace instead of rudeness and meanness to our fellow brothers and sisters, we'll come with grace. Because now I'm looking at somebody, I'm saying, man, do you know the battle I just went through pulling out this plank? It's going to be hard to get your spec, brother or sister. But I'm coming with grace now. I'm not coming in pride like, oh, you, this is all you got to do, just rip it off like a Band-Aid, just yank it out. No, because you didn't go through it. But once you go through it and you came out on the other side, now you can help people. But the devil says, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, there's nothing wrong with you. Didn't Paul say there was a thorn in his flesh? Yeah, that's all this is. That's all it is. You don't got to, don't even think about it anymore. Don't even worry about it. It's just going to, it's always going to be there. The doctrines of demons. I'm almost done here. You know what this word doctrines in the Greek is? It's, uh, the word is dida, didascalia. It means a well-packaged teaching 
that is easily applied to a lifestyle. Isn't that interesting that they chose that Greek word there for a doctrine of a demon? A demonic doctrine. Oh, not something that's real confusing. The lies of the devil? Oh, you don't need to know the Greek or the Hebrew for that. You know when he prepares for you, the devil? Just like when you order those boxes from the internet and they ask you all your favorite things you like and they say, we're going to send you a personalized gift every month, just how you like it. This is what the devil does. Who I got up? Demonic forces of whiting, who's up next? Oh, Irene? Okay. No, no, you know what? You know what I got to get for her? Oh, I know what I can grab for her. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Put this in this package. Send that her way. And you know what's in that package? Something that's easy, easy to accept and apply to your life. That's the strategy. Well packaged, well thought out, delivered, easily accepted, easily applied, and just seamlessly fits in your lifestyle as it is. And when this teaching is presented, these doctrines of these demons, it sounds logical. It appears to the flesh like something that makes sense both spiritually and also good for the flesh. That's why the Word of God says, test every spirit. Because just because it seems good spiritually doesn't mean it's good spiritually. Just because that brother said, let me and you have our own Bible study doesn't mean that that's going to be good spiritually. Amen? But they package it well. If you're somebody who's on the verge of quitting, who's ready to give up, tired and frustrated, we've all been there. You know what the devil's bringing you? Not a motivational speech. Something well packaged and easy to apply. Oh, just take this. And you go, ah, I, guess, I guess it's not that bad just to step away for a little bit. Not going to hurt nobody if I just stop going. I need some me time. I need to figure myself out. See, those are things that are easily applied. Makes sense. Oh, then the devil will get biblical. Didn't David escape to the cave? Oh, yeah, I got to just isolate myself. That's what I got to do. Well packaged. Easily applied to your life. Yet the origins are in the demonic realm. And we don't even realize it. Eve, what did the devil tell her? Die. Oh, you won't surely die. No, 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 no. That's not what's going to happen. You know what's actually going to happen? Is you'll be like God. Knowing what's right and knowing what's wrong. Good and evil. Then the Bible says that Eve, looking at the apple, seeing that it was good to eat pleasing to the eyes, and desiring to make one wise, well-packaged, logical, spiritually and physically, and easily applied. Just take a bite. And that's the enemy. And that's the way he works. Not like the movies portray him shaking doors and breaking windows and opening up fridges and, and has uh, f deep freezers walking up the stairs like that. He doesn't work like that. You know how he works? Well packaged, logical, both spiritually and physically, and easily applied. And then he just stands back and watches. Fully satisfied that, one, you're still in the faith. Did you notice the phrasing? Falling away, gradually walking away. The devil's fully satisfied that all he got you to do was take that package. Because he knows, oh, it might take a year, two, three, four, however long he has to wait. 
But the more you embrace that instead of God's truth, the more you'll just gradually till you fall away. Kent Crockett, in his book, I Once Was Blind, But Now I Squint, he wrote this, when you're driving your car and listening to a radio station, you'll get the clearest signal when you're closest to the tower. It's easy to hear the station's music because you are near the source. But if you're driving out of town or going away from the tower, the radio signal gets weaker and starts breaking up. When you stop hearing that station, you'll eventually start picking up other radio signals from other stations, getting stronger as you get closer. This is what happens in the spiritual realm. When we are spiritually close to God, we're able to clearly hear him. But the moment we start to drift away, his voice gets softer and softer, and then the enemy comes with his radio station. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, it's my last verse. Well, second to last. For the time will come when they will not endure. The word endure is talking about they just, they can't put up with it anymore. Can't take it anymore. They will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. This scripture has recently literally gave me chills to my bone. You know what I thought about when I was reading this? Social media subscription. Because we decide who we want to listen to, and what we want to see. And he said, because they want their ears tickled. Other translations say itching ears. Because they have something that they want scratched, they'll accumulate for themselves. Teachers, not teachers who don't agree with them, notice that, in accordance to their own desire. And they'll turn aside to myths. John 10, 27 says, My sheep, Jesus said this, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. See, when you stop following, you'll stop hearing. And then you need to ask yourself, what am I listening to now? What have I accumulated to myself? Because we'll be walking right into a death trap. Not even realize it. Now we see why the Spirit said explicitly, no, you better hear this and know this, that in those later days, people are going to be falling away simply because they were listening to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. What are we taking in? What are we embracing? What are we exchanging? We all know it's the last days, so here's, here's your knowledge now. This is the tactic. So now what are we going to do? Are we going to continue to give the enemy that place in our lives? Oh, no, no, I know your strategy now. I see what you're trying to do now. No, 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 I'm going to defend myself against that. And I'm going to watch even more diligently what I'm taking into my life what I'm accepting as truth. Is it based off what the Bible says? Or am I trying to be wise in my own eyes, clever in my own sight? The Bible says, woe to you if you want to live that way. Because you'll end up calling evil good and good evil. You'll end up calling bitter sweet and sweet bitter. God says, that's a scary, scary place to be. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. The 